Welcome to the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. I actually think the psychedelic experience is significant because it, it addresses the two biggest problems we face as a civilization, which I would list as tribalism and the environmental crisis. They both involve the objectifying of the other, whether that other is nature or other people. And what is tribalism but a collective version of ego? So here we have a tool that at least for the individual breaks down these ego formations, allows us to have a deep connection with the natural world and focus on our likeness rather than our unlikeness with other people. But how do you prescribe a drug to a whole culture? It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. We stand at the threshold of a historic opportunity in the human experiment to reimagine how to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. It's a revolution from the heart of nature and the human heart. In this series, The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, we celebrate social and scientific innovators with breakthrough solutions for restoring people and planet, creating a future environment of hope. Support for the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is provided in part by Organic Valley Family of Farms and by the generous support of listeners like you. LSD does cause psychosis in the people who don't take it. So said Timothy Leary at the height of the 60s after LSD escaped from medical labs and went wild in the streets. It was as though the thriving counterculture had moved from Kansas to Oz. Meanwhile, a plethora of medical experiments was showing real therapeutic merit. LSD demonstrated so much promise in treating alcoholism that Alcoholics Anonymous founder Bill Wilson seriously considered including it in his program. In 1966, LSD was criminalized, summarily stigmatizing and halting medical research for decades to come. Until, that is, the past decade plus, when a quiet renaissance of serious medical research has once again arisen to study LSD and other psychedelics, such as psilocybin mushrooms. At the same time, the popular usage of psychedelics in the U.S. has swelled to become as big as in the heyday of the 60s. As if to punctuate the threshold moment with an exclamation point, in 2018, a new book hit the bestseller lists. In How to Change Your Mind, What the New Science of Psychedelics Teaches Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and Transcendence, the acclaimed journalist Michael Pollan documents how psychedelics are helping people with everything from overcoming addiction and depression to easing the existential terror of terminal illness. He calls it white coat shamanism. But that's just one piece of a much more curious picture. Pollen slips through the rabbit hole into the mystery of consciousness itself. Could the transformational healing that psychedelics can bring on the personal ego level translate into cultural healing that could address the greatest issues of our time? This is The Reluctant Psychonaut, How Psychedelics Changed Michael Pollan's Mind. I'm Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. I was a very reluctant psychonaut. I had very little experience. I kind of got into it when I was about to turn 60, which is, I know, not age appropriate. Um, <laughs> and the reasons for that were that I was, I was afraid. I was a little late to the 60s party, and by the time it kind of swam into my awareness, all you heard were terrifying stories about people jumping out of windows and staring at the sun till they went blind and scrambled your chromosomes and all that kept me away. 
I also thought I was psychologically too fragile, I think, that this assault on my psyche I might not be able to withstand. So I kind of, with the exception of a couple low-dose like, uh, psilocybin experiments in my late 20s, I really had nothing to do with it. So I bring not a long history, but the power of first sight to this subject. Writer Michael Pollan's gift of first sight has consistently shifted the national conversation on issues central to human existence, from our relationship to food with his book The Omnivore's Dilemma to our relationship with plants in The Botany of Desire. With How to Change Your Mind, the rigorous reporter and congenital skeptic has provided an authoritative analysis of everything science has learned about psychedelics and the mysteries yet to be plumbed. But what made him letter perfect for this mission improbable is his brand, immersive journalism. In other words, he samples his subject. At a Bioneers conference, Michael Pollan shared a travelogue of his repertorial and personal journey with psychedelics. I got into psychedelics as a journalist. It was a journalistic quest that gradually evolved, actually very quickly evolved, into a spiritual quest, into a personal quest. I'd read about these studies of terminal cancer patients being given psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, to help them with their existential terror. Now, to me, when I first heard about it, this seemed like a really bad idea. The last thing I would want if I was facing right up against my mortality was to lose my mind. This is not underground work. This was going on at NYU and at Johns Hopkins, two of the leading medical institutions in the country. So I I, uh, got an assignment to write about it for The New Yorker, and it resulted in a piece called The Trip Treatment, which you can read online. And I started interviewing these cancer patients. The background to this story, which I didn't realize till much later, was that my father had a terminal cancer diagnosis around the same time. He just died in January. He was in his late 80s, and he never wanted to talk about How was he thinking about death? How was he processing this cataclysm? Either he was processing it internally or he was in denial. I never sort of figured it out. So I had this intense curiosity to engage in these conversations with people who were confronting their mortality and were trying to deal with it. And they were the most amazing people and the most amazing conversations. People would have experiences in which they went into their body and confronted their cancer, in which they met God. These are high-dose experiences in which they felt their sense of self completely dissolve and followed by emerging into some larger entity. Some of them, I remember, beheld this great plane of consciousness that they understood their own consciousness would join when their bodies died. And they emerged from these experiences, about two-thirds of them, all the ones who had powerful mystical experiences, with a completely new understanding of where they were and what was happening to them. Many of them lost their fear of dying. It was the most incredible thing and very hard to, for me to understand from outside. I remember talking, there was one woman I, I interviewed who um, had had ovarian cancer. It was in remission, but she still had this terror of recurrence. This is a woman in her early 60s and a fairly timid woman, figure skating instructor in Manhattan. And she went into her body on her experience and she saw this black mass underneath her rib cage. And she realized that wasn't her cancer because it was in the wrong place. It was her fear. Now, when you do one of these guided experiences, there are two people with you, a man and a woman the whole time. You're wearing eye shades and listening to music, a playlist on headphones. And all of a sudden, she screams at the black mass, although they don't know this, get the f*** out of my body. (laughs) And with that, her fear just poof, disappeared. And I wrote in the article, uh, in the draft, that, and her fear was, uh, you know, substantially diminished, something safe that would get past the New Yorker fact checkers. And, but when they called her to read this, and they said, well, he, is it true that your fear was substantially diminished, fear of death? She said, no, he got that wrong. That's completely wrong. My fear was eliminated. Leading medical researcher Stanislav Grof, who worked extensively with LSD while it was legal in the 50s and 60s at the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health, observed one major therapeutic discovery of that era. When you change consciousness, Grof said, it activates the psyche's self-healing potential. 
The fact that we have such narrow and superficial psychiatry means that we diagnose as psychotic certain states which could potentially be transformative, healing, and even evolutionary. The current explosion of medical studies to determine the therapeutic value of psychedelic substances is once again revealing the self-healing potential of the psyche. From veterans suffering from PTSD to people struggling with autism, depression, and addiction. The studies span the globe from the U.S. to Israel, Switzerland, Brazil, and the Netherlands. As Michael Pollan absorbed the depth of the transformative experiences of cancer patients, he knew he had to take his own trip into immersive journalism. But I have to say, I was terrified. I had several guided and unguided experiences on several different medicines. And every night, there would be this ping-pong match of, are you crazy? You could have a heart attack. You're going to go to the middle of nowhere with this guy, and is he going to call 911 if something happens? And, and then this other voice was like, aren't you really curious to know what would happen? And I realized the first voice was my ego defending itself because it knew what was coming, an assault on it. <laughs> and the problem with your ego is it has command of your rational faculties, so it makes really good arguments <laughs> that are hard to ignore. But in every case, I was able to ignore it. But you have to realize, too, when you start late, like, yeah, like I, I had to call my cardiologist before I did this. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're 60, it's... So he was cool with everything except MDMA. And he may have been wrong about that. I don't know. In his book, The Botany of Desire, A Plant's Eye View of the World, Michael Pollan explored the provocative question of whether plants have consciousness, intentions, and purpose. But this proposition had remained an intellectual abstraction for the avid gardener, until, that is, he took a deep dive into psychedelics in his beloved garden. Without a guide, I had a, a fairly high-dose experience in my garden, and I had a very strong sense that consciousness was spread more equally over the natural world than I had ever thought before, and that as I was gazing at these leaves, these leaves were gazing back at me with incredible benign affect, but that everything was much more alive than it had ever been. And so what had been this intellectual conceit became this felt truth, this conviction. And I think that's one of the things psychedelics do is that they put flesh on ideas, ideas that I already had. So I want to read you a, a brief passage from what it was like to walk through my garden toward the end of this experience. Picture a, a summer day in New England, very hot summer day with lots of things flitting around. My walk back to the house was, I think, the peak of the experience and comes back to me now in the colors and tones of a dream. There was again the sense of pushing my body through a mass of air that had been sweetened by flocks and was teeming, almost frenetic with activity. The dragonflies, big as birds, were now out in force, touching down just long enough to kiss the flocks' blossoms and then lift off before madly crisscrossing the garden path. There were more dragonflies than I had ever seen in one place, so many, in fact, that I wasn't completely sure if they were real. Judith, my wife, later confirmed the sighting when I got her to come outside. And as they executed their flight patterns, they left behind them contrails that persisted in the air, or so at least it appeared. Dusk now approaching, the air traffic in the garden had built to a riotous crescendo. The pollinators making their last rounds of the day, the plants still signifying to them with their flowers, me, me, me. In one way, I knew this scene well, the garden coming briefly to life after the heat of a summer day had relented, but never had I felt so integral to it. I was no longer the alienated human observer, gazing at the garden from a distance, whether literal or figural, but rather felt part and parcel of all that was transpiring here. So the flowers were addressing me as much as the pollinators, and perhaps because the very air that afternoon was such a felt presence, it was so humid, one's usual sense of oneself as a subject observing objects in space objects that have been thrown into relief and rendered discreet by the apparent void that surrounds them, gave way to a sense of being deep inside and fully implicated in the scene, one more being in relation to the myriad other beings and to the whole. 
Everything is interaction and reciprocal, wrote Alexander von Humboldt, the great 18th century naturalist. And that felt very much the case. And so for the first time did this that he also said, I myself am identical with nature. When we return, how psychedelics challenge the committed scientific materialist Michael Pollan's view of spirituality and how psychedelics may present valuable tools for society at large to address our greatest crises. This is The Reluctant Psychonaut, how psychedelics changed Michael Pollan's mind. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. To see and hear more from Michael Pollan and other Bioneers, or to subscribe to our podcast, visit Bioneers.org. Many researchers believe the positive results that study subjects experience in medical trials have as much to do with their skillful guides as with the substances. In fact, controlled conditions can be crucial for what is often an uncontrollable, disorienting, and alternately terrifying or ecstatic experience. When Michael Pollan decided to take a high dose of psilocybin mushrooms, he knew a sense of security was crucial. He met with his guide, Mary, and felt safe with her. As he put on his eye shades and settled into the couch, sure enough, the trip got off to a rocky start. One of the things that happens on psychedelics is you can see music. And what I saw was a computer-generated black-and-white landscape that was not my thing. I don't like video games. It's not the space I wanted to be in. I wanted natural imagery. And it went on and on and on, and I started to feel kind of claustrophobic. And, and we argued about the music, and I had her change it, but I, got, I was stuck in computer world. And finally, I had to pee, and I took off the eye shades. And what, the amazing thing is you can kind of like come back into reality when you need to for a little while. And uh, she kind of helped me get to the bathroom, and I was very careful not to look in the mirror. Um, <laughs> you don't want to do that. I said this to an audience in England of, of very experienced people, and they were like, oh, yes, trip face. Mm. <laughs> so I didn't do that. And, um, and I uh, produced this spectacular crop of diamonds, and then made my way back to the futon where I was. And Mary asked me if I wanted a booster dose. And I was in for the whole thing, so I said yes. And then this really weird thing happens. And she's kneeling by, by my side. I'm in this uh, futon. And I look at her. And she's normally Scandinavian looking with long blonde hair and high cheekbones. And she suddenly had black hair and weathered brown skin. And I knew exactly who she had turned into, Maria Sabina who some of you will know is the Mazatec woman from Huatla de Jimenez in uh, Mexico, who actually gave the first white man from the West psilocybin in the 1950s. So a key figure in the history of psychedelics. And she had turned, and I didn't think I should tell Mary what had happened to her. Um, <laughs> so I took the additional dose, and I put on the eye shades again, and then the most spooky thing happened. I'm out of computer world now, and I suddenly... And, and the pronouns are going to sound weird, I see myself burst into just this cloud of little post-it notes. Little <laughs> I'd been blasted to bits. But I was watching the scene. There was another perspective that had opened up. And I watched, and then I looked out. I'd been liquefied. I had turned into paint or butter, just kind of coating the landscape. But I was fine with it. This other eye had emerged, was like, that's what happens, you turn into paint. <laughs> and, 
And it was the most amazing thing. I didn't have a self, but this other perspective had arisen that had this perfect equanimity. Whatever happened is fine. It wasn't exactly me, and I don't know what it was. Um, Aldous Huxley would say it was the mind at large. It was some kind of universal consciousness. But I realized it was precisely the consciousness that those cancer patients had described to me. The one that made the, the death of their bodily selves and their egos bearable. And when that happens, when your self falls apart, if you feel safe, because if you fight this, that's a bad trip. If you feel safe without the walls of the ego and the self, these channels open up. What rushes in is your sense of connection. You have no defenses anymore. You are wide open, and so you merge, whether it's with nature or other people, and you feel this, these channels of love opening up, and this sense of fellow feeling with natural things. And for me, there was a moment where I merged with a piece of music that I had persuaded her to put on, um, this uh, Bach unaccompanied cello concerto, which is an amazing, sad piece. I mean, it's all about death. Uh, this is the sweet in G minor. And I just became the music. I became the cello. I felt the bow, the friction of the bow going over my skin. It was just this perfect merging. In truth, Pollen's sense of ego death, of merging with the oneness of all creation, echoes the same vision that shamans and indigenous peoples who use psychedelic substances have described for centuries and millennia. Today's white coat shamanism stands in this shamanic lineage that says it's all connected, and we're all connected. As Pollen wrote, when the ego dissolves, so does a bounded conception not only of our self, but of our self-interest. What emerges in its place is invariably a broader, more open-hearted, and altruistic, that is, more spiritual, idea of what matters in life. One in which a new sense of connection or love, however defined, seems to figure prominently. So what happens the morning after? In one of these guided trips, you come back the next day for an integration session. And I came back, and she asked me what had happened. I told her I'd had this ego dissolution. And she's like, well, that's worth the price of admission, don't you think? And I said, yeah, but it's over. I'm back. My, my ego's back. It's in uniform. It's on patrol. <laughs> my defenses are all back. And she said, well, you've had a, a taste of another way to be of a more open, less defended way to be. And you have that memory, and you can reconnect to it. And I asked her how, and she said, through meditation. And that is now how I reconnect to it. I mean, I think it's a very logical outgrowth, because you can't do psychedelics every day. It's a really bad idea. I don't recommend it. Um, but you can have that opening that can help you. Now, I want to say something about the larger value of this experience, because I think that it has a relevance to our, our situation, our, our social, political, and environmental situation. I actually think the psychedelic experience is significant because it, it addresses the two biggest problems we face as a civilization, which I would list as tribalism and the environmental crisis. They're actually very similar. They both involve the objectifying of the other, whether that other is nature or other people, people of different faiths, different races, different political views. And what is tribalism but a collective version of ego, right? It's defensive, it builds walls, it refuses connection. So here we have a tool that at least for the individual breaks down these ego formations, allows us to have a deep connection with the natural world and focus on our likeness rather than our unlikeness with other people. That seems enormously promising. But how do you prescribe a drug to a whole culture? <laughs> so that's the challenge that faces us. We have a tool that addresses the two biggest problems we face, and it certainly works well in the individual, and perhaps if more individuals could have this experience, but that is a challenge. How do you democratize this loss of ego, right? Temporary loss of ego for, for learning purposes. 
Um, and here's where my understanding of spirituality changed, and I'll leave you with this. Remember I said the opposite of spiritual I always believed was material, and that those two things were, could not be reconciled. I no longer think that's the case. Everything I experienced can be understood without any resort to the supernatural, okay? Connection to other people, connection to nature. Scientists tell us we are. We're social beings. We're totally dependent on one another. And we're completely part and parcel of the natural world. We're no different than any other species. It's just our egos, intent on objectifying things, won't let us see this. So really, I came to understand I, I had it all wrong about spiritual experience. The opposite of spiritual is egotistical. And to the extent we can work on that, and we need to work on that to have any spiritual development. So I'll leave you with that thought. How do we take that, that knowledge and democratize it, give it to as many people as possible, and use it to untie this giant knot. So, thank you very much. Thank you. The Reluctant Psychonaut how psychedelics changed Michael Pollan's mind. You can see and hear more from Michael Pollan and explore award-winning Bioneers radio programs, podcasts, blogs, and videos online at Bioneers.org. For information on attending the National Bioneers Conference and Bioneers events in your area, please visit Bioneers.org or call 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ossibel. Written by Kenny Ossibel. Senior producer and station relations, Stephanie Welch. Host and consulting producer, Neil Harvey. Producer, Teo Grossman. Program engineer and music supervisor, Emily Harris. Our theme music is co-written by the Baca Forest people of Cameroon and Baca Beyond from the album East to West. All royalties from Baca compositions and performances go to the Baca Forest people through the charity Global Music Exchange. Find out more at globalmusicexchange.org. Additional music was made available by Rod Hamilton, Tiffany Seal, and Daniel Birch, at freemusicarchive.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers' Revolution from the Heart of Nature are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Bioneers and Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. This is program number 0118. This program was made possible in part by Organic Valley's pasture-raised organic dairy products, bringing the good from our family farmers to your table at organicvalley.coop, and by the generous support of listeners like you.